You're listening to Quantum Harry the Podcast, a podcast version of the book Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse by B.L. Purdom. Episode 3, Iron Maiden. In Episode 2 of Quantum Harry the Podcast, I examined a number of characters in the series who embody the archetype of the wise old man. In this episode, we'll look at a number of character trios who collectively embody the female archetypes of the maiden, mother, and crone, as well as maiden, mother, crone trios in classical mythology. But then I'll focus on the youngest female archetype, the maiden, which is the ruling archetype for Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, and we'll look both at the characters who embody that archetype and the character who best embodies it, such that Harry, the protagonist, steps into that character's shoes during the climax of the book. I'd like to begin with a quote from chapter four of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Famous Harry Potter, said Malfoy, can't even go into a bookshop without making the front page. Leave him alone, he didn't want all that, said Ginny. It was the first time she had spoken in front of Harry. She was glaring at Malfoy. Potter, you've got yourself a girlfriend, drawled Malfoy. A prominent trio of female characters in the Harry Potter books, Ginny Weasley, Hermione Granger, and Luna Lovegood, can be seen as the archetypes of the Maiden, Mother, and Crone, but they aren't the only characters that fit these archetypes. They're also not the only group of three characters who comprise a trio of the three female archetypes. According to Joseph Campbell, woman, in the picture language of mythology, represents the totality of what can be known. As the hero progresses in the slow initiation which is life, the form the form of the goddess undergoes for him a series of transfigurations. She lures, she guides, she bids him burst his fetters, and if he can match her import, the two, the knower and the known, will be released from every limitation. J.K. Rowling overtly references the Weird Sisters, W-E-I-R-D, in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, calling the band at the Yule Ball the Weird Sisters, W-Y-R-D. The original sisters were the witches in Shakespeare's Macbeth. As Macbeth learns, Shakespeare's trio is similar to the Fates from Greek mythology, who are believed to hold everyone's destiny in their hands, or rather, in the threads that they hold in their hands. The fates have many names. The three graces, because flattery was supposed to make them want to be nice. The ancient ones, and the harsh spinners, which may or may not have something to do with the name of Spinner's End, home of Severus Snape. But even though the fates are all depicted as three old women, each one can be equated with maiden, mother, or crone, based on what they do, just as Ginny, Hermione, and Luna are all teenagers who embody these archetypes, based on what their characters do. In Greek mythology, Cloto, C-L-O-T-H-O, is the fate representing the maiden, who spins the thread at the beginning of a person's life. Lachesis, L-A-C-H-E-S-I-S, -S, equals the mother. She is the weaver or knitter who weaves the tapestry of life with its complexities and intertwining relationships. Atropos, A-T-R-O-P-O-S, is the crone who ruthlessly cuts the thread at the end of life. Each fate has a job and attributes that align with the maiden, the mother, or the crone, but they also perform these roles as a group. As the three graces, in various myths, they give a newborn qualities that will serve throughout that person's life, which is an attribute of the archetypal maiden, who is present at beginnings. The fates were supposed to watch over women in labor, which is an obvious attribute of the archetypal mother. They've also been known as a group to resist attempts to circumvent the end of life. When the goddess Artemis was heartbroken over her beloved Hippolytus dying, she asked Asclepius, the god of medicine, to revive him. But when he succeeded, Hades, the god of the underworld, and the fates were scandalized by this breach of privilege, and they asked Zeus to kill Asclepius with a thunderbolt. Hades' reaction to Artemis bringing Hippolytus back to life is a little different than the reaction that the character of death has in the fairy tale in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows called the Three Brothers, but in some ways it's not all that different. Hades was just less subtle about returning Asclepius to where he felt he belonged with the other dead people. 
Either way, entities like the Fates and Hades, who preside over death or personify death, don't take it well when people try to get around dying in any way. The three faces of the moon goddess were also equated with a maiden, mother, and crone. The maiden was represented by the new moon, the mother by the full moon, which looks like a pregnant belly, and the crone by the waning moon. The moon was also in general associated with women because of a woman's monthly cycle. One of the maiden goddesses in Greek religion is Athena. Another name for her is Pallas, P-A-L-L-A-S, which means maiden. And another one of Athena's names, Parthenos, P-A-R-T-H-E-N-O-S, means virgin or girl, which is also what Kore means, K-O-R-E, which is yet another name for Athena. Athena is linked to spinning, just as the fate Cloto spins the thread of each life at its beginning. Kore is also used for Persephone, the goddess of spring and rebirth, and the consort of Hades, the god of the dead. In Greek mythology, Persephone's return to her mother Demeter from the underworld each spring brings the world back to life. The Furies are another female trio in Greek mythology. Their purpose is to avenge crimes of perjury and parricide, which means killing one of your own parents. They're usually seen specifically avenging mothers, such as when Orestes killed his mother Clytemnestra for murdering his father Agamemnon after the Trojan War. The Furies are described as old women with snakes for hair, dogs' heads, coal-black bodies, bats' wings, and bloodshot eyes. This description makes me wonder whether the Furies' bat wings have any connection to Ginny being fond of the bat bogey hex, which she uses for revenge. The Furies aren't the same as the fair-haired and swift-winged harpies, who snatch up criminals for punishment by the Furies. However, harpies are remarkably similar to the descriptions of the Vila at the Quidditch World Cup. When they become infuriated, they go from irresistibly beautiful fair-haired women to harsh, sharp, avenging birds who hurl balls of flame. It's also interesting that in the seventh book, Ginny has a poster for the Holyhead Harpies, a Quidditch team made up entirely of women, on the wall of her bedroom. According to J.K. Rowling, Ginny will play for the team after she leaves school, before becoming a sports reporter and writing about Quidditch instead of playing. Another bird-like trio of women in Greek mythology, resembling Velas, are the Sirens. Homer reduced them to two, but they were originally three singing daughters of the earth, who were depicted as birds. Odysseus had his sailors plug their ears with beeswax on instruction from the witch Kirke so they wouldn't hear the sirens, while he was lashed to the mast of his ship so he could appreciate their songs, but not do anything stupid, like steer the ship onto the rocks. We again see this similarity to Vila's in Goblet of Fire, before they become upset. Mr. Weasley tells Harry and his sons to plug their ears with their fingers while the Vila's sing, so they won't be affected. Because of the overwhelming bird imagery in Greek mythology associated with forces of female vengeance, it's not really surprising that when Hermione is upset with Ron because of Lavender Brown in Half-Blood Prince, she sends a flock of canaries after him. Ginny Weasley is an obvious maiden. She's the rescued damsel in distress in Chamber of Secrets, and Harry's eventual love interest in the sixth book and beyond. The youth gets the girl, and the girl must be a maiden. In ancient Greek religion, the maiden aspect of the goddess was invoked for new beginnings. Harry is starting a new life in Philosopher's Stone. He's going to a new school, taking a journey, and embarking on his first real friendships. Ginny is the youngest female character with whom he has contact, and she's at King's Cross when he begins that journey. Molly Weasley, who's also present, is a mother figure, for obvious reasons, but her presence is less symbolic than practical. She's taking her kids to the train. J.K. Rowling makes a great point of Harry watching Ginny the Maiden chase the train as it pulls out of the station, as if she's watching over him during the beginning of this new phase in his life. In the fifth book, Ginny accompanies and guides Harry on the school train. For the first time, he isn't with Ron during his entire trip to school, which he even was in Chamber of Secrets when he and Ron fly the Fort Anglia to school. Ginny introduces him to a new friend, Luna Lovegood. Post Goblet of Fire, Harry is embarking on another new phase of life in a world with a revitalized Voldemort, so it's appropriate that he's again accompanied by the Maiden. Ginny is repeatedly linked to hope and new life, such as when she brings an Easter egg to Harry in the fifth book. 
She marks herself as the harbinger of new possibilities by telling him that hanging around with Fred and George long enough makes you believe that nearly anything is possible, and she's the one who enables Harry to speak to Sirius when he needs to. She also helps him to avoid expulsion, as he did for her in the second book, by coming up with the name Dumbledore's Army. Ginny christening the group is symbolically the same as a maiden goddess blessing its beginnings. In Chamber of Secrets, Harry feels incredibly depressed by the thought that Ginny might be dead when they find out that she's been taken into the chamber. He knows that he must do whatever is necessary to rescue her if there's any possibility at all that she might be alive. She's like Persephone taken by Hades. She must be retrieved for the world to have life again. Remember, his school is threatened with closing after she's taken into the chamber. As long as Ginny's all right, Harry's world is fine by extension. She symbolizes all that's cheerful and life-affirming. But this is why he has to part from her at the end of Half-Blood Prince. He needs to do everything in his power to protect her and avoid losing her permanently, so he's willing to lose her temporarily, just as Persephone's mother Demeter resigns herself to losing Persephone part of each year. <laughs> Another maiden mother crone trio in Harry's life are the girls we know about in his year in Gryffindor, Parvati, Hermione, and Lavender. Parvati is the name of an Indian goddess who is the epitome of the maiden. The beautiful nubile Parvati fasts and tortures herself, faithful for years to the god Shiva, until her faithfulness is rewarded and she becomes his consort. Parvati Patil is the first girl who goes out with Harry. As Harry enters into a frightening new world, dating, he's accompanied by a representative of the Maiden. J.K. Rowling had Parvati and Ginny follow precisely the same pattern in the Yule Ball episode of the fourth book. In this sequence, Neville is Harry's doppelganger, or double, which is an echo of Harry giving Neville's name as his alias when he gets on the night bus in the third book. And in Order of the Phoenix, Rowling reveals that either Harry or Neville Longbottom could have been the child in Trelawney's prophecy. So the Yule Ball pattern is 1. Harry and Neville ask girls they fancy to the ball. Harry asks Cho Chang and Neville asks Hermione Granger. 2. The girls, Cho and Hermione, are both archetypal mothers. 3. Both boys discover that each girl they've asked to the ball is already going with someone else. And in both cases, it turns out to be another one of the champions. Cho is going with Cedric Diggory, and though Hermione doesn't tell Neville or anyone beforehand, she's going with Victor Crumb. 4. Harry and Neville each ask another girl to the ball. Harry asks Parvati Patil, and Neville asks Ginny Weasley, both archetypal maidens. 5. Both of these girls meet a boy at the Yule Ball. Parvati meets a boy from the French magic school Beaubaton, and Ginny meets Michael Corner, a Ravenclaw, though we don't find out about Ginny and Michael until the fifth book. The boys Ginny and Parvati meet have something in common. Beaubaton students sit with the Ravenclaws when they're at Hogwarts, and they become, in effect, honorary Ravenclaws during their stay at the school, just as Durmstrang students become honorary Slytherins. So Parvati's Beaubaton boy and Michael Corner are a virtual Ravenclaw and an actual Ravenclaw, each meeting a character who is an archetypal maiden at the Yule Ball, who went with Harry or a Harry doppelganger, after the archetypal mother characters Harry and his doppelganger initially asked agreed to go to the ball with a tournament champion who isn't Harry or his doppelganger. <laughs> The Black Sisters are another maiden mother crone trio, Narcissa Black Malfoy being the mother, and Bellatrix Black Lestrange the crone. Andromeda Black's Tonks is the sister we don't see until the seventh book. Andromeda is the name of an archetypal mythological maiden who was chained to a rock for a monster to devour. Another classic damsel in distress, which is a story role that maidens often filled before the rise of fairy tales, in which maidens were more often the heroes. Before we see Andromeda Tonks in the seventh book, she's represented in the text by her daughter, Nymphadora Tonks, an auror, who can change things about her appearance like her hair's color and length, or the shape of her nose. When Tonks makes her hair long and red in the Order of the Phoenix, Harry thinks that she looks like Ginny's older sister, which means she's being presented pretty clearly in this passage as Ginny's double or doppelganger. The reason for this is clearer at the end of the sixth book. This is because Tonks is part of one of two maiden and youth couples who were contrasted with Harry and Ginny in the sixth book, just as Ginny's Yule Ball experience was being contrasted with Parvati's experience in Goblet of Fire. Like Harry, Remus Lupin feels that it's too dangerous for anyone to be in a relationship with him. Unlike Harry, who splits up with Ginny at the end of Half-Blood Prince to protect her, Remus is soon disabused of this notion. 
Remus and Tonks are a couple at Dumbledore's funeral, and they're married and expecting a baby early in Deathly Hallows. The other couple contrasted with Harry and Ginny is Bill Weasley and Fleur Delacour. Fleur Delacour is another archetypal maiden. Her name means flower in general. This marks Fleur as a harbinger of new life, and the others in her trio are her mother and her sister. Mrs. Delacour is an obvious mother figure, but Fleur's sister Gabrielle, which is the feminine of the men's name Gabriel, evokes an angel, as in the archangel Gabriel, which connects her to the afterlife and death concerns of the archetypal crone. So the youngest person in this trio embodies the oldest archetype. Ginny isn't jealous of other girls who might attract Harry except for Fleur. Harry assures Ginny that he finds Fleur ugly, which is something he failed to do to reassure Cho concerning Hermione when he and Cho were together in Order of the Phoenix. At the end of the sixth book, Tonks and Remus are together, and Fleur and Bill are still planning their wedding, since Fleur has declared her intention to stand by Bill after he's attacked by the same werewolf who bit Remus Lupin as a small child. This leaves only Harry and Ginny waiting to follow this same pattern of the archetypal maiden and archetypal youth reuniting. Ginny, Tonks, and Fleur are all somewhat impressive as maidens. Ginny is a trained member of Dumbledore's army who holds her own in the battle at the Ministry, as well as at the end of the sixth and seventh books at Hogwarts. Tonks is an Auror who also fights in those three battles at the end of the fifth, sixth, and seventh books. And Fleur was the one student chosen from all of the students of Beaubaton to represent that school in the Triwizard Tournament. Harry's repeated romantic and pseudo-romantic links to maidens makes it possible to see why Ginny is the love interest, Parvati was his first date, Fleur is the girl Harry needs to insult to reassure Ginny of his infections, and Tonks is seen by Harry as Ginny's older sister. This also seems to be why Rowling created Remus slash Tonks and Bill slash Fleur as doppelganger couples to Harry slash Ginny, telegraphing that their story is far from over at the end of the sixth book and that they will be a couple again. Harry stepping into the shoes of the character best embodying the ruling archetype doesn't make him that archetype any more than his having doppelgangers of other archetypes makes him those archetypes. Instead, this positions Harry firmly as the hero throughout the series, who, at the climax of each book, connects to the book's theme by echoing the actions of the character embodying the ruling archetype of the book or serving as a surrogate for that character. The Maiden is the ruling archetype of the second book, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. In this book, the character best embodying the Maiden is Ginny Weasley, whose actions propel the plot forward. As Harry's future romantic partner, she has attributes that are the opposite of Harry's, completing him and making him whole, and she has attributes that make her his counterpart, a female version of him in other words. Their archetypes are the youngest, Maiden and Youth, and they'll eventually hold the same game position or battle rank of Seeker on the Gryffindor Quidditch team. Ginny occasionally plays Chaser, but her most important matches involve her being a Seeker in Harry's place. Harry takes Ginny's place in the second book, just as he takes Dumbledore's to defend the Philosopher's Stone, by writing in Tom Riddle's diary and being fooled by Riddle, plus speaking Parseltongue to enter the Chamber of Secrets, all of which Ginny did earlier in the book. Echoing her actions to access the chamber allows him to destroy the diary with a basilisk's fang, which is very important to the series as a whole because this tells him how to destroy most of the other horcruxes in the seventh book. After the diary is depleted of its Voldemort soul bit, Ginny awakes and no longer seems to be in the realm of Hades. She is like Persephone, returned from the underworld. The school also comes back to life, no longer at the risk of being closed, and the ensuing party is like a May Day festival, a celebration of the world waking once more and the death of metaphorical winter, all because the maiden and Harry's ultimate partner has returned to the land of the living. You've been listening to Quantum Harry the Podcast, a podcast version of the book Quantum Harry, A Unified Theory of the Potterverse by B. L. Purdom. All music heard on Quantum Harry is composed and performed by B. L. Purdom. Next time on Quantum Harry the Podcast, Episode 4, Mother May I, an examination of the archetype of the mother in the Harry Potter series. I hope you'll join me.